Welcome to week 15, commercial data driven websites. This is really kind of a summation and talking about a way forward. I'm adjunct instructor Charles W. Bill Marshall. You can reach me at that email address to schedule an appointment and then we will have a Microsoft team meeting or you can call me during office hours at that telephone number. This is the last lecture in CIT 253, which is a three credit hour course, Data Driven Web Pages. And as always, Blackboard is the official site for assignments and to turn in assignments. But I do have supplemental, supplemental information available at www.cwmclass.com. So our whole goal has been to develop web, data driven websites and we hope that they're scalable and we've written with HTML and cascading style sheets and JavaScript and PHP and we use all those tools to envelop, to use Ajax to communicate with the MySQL database on Apache and I did this not because I think you're going to want to handwrite websites but because I wanted you to understand the technology layers that are underneath what's going on in the modern website. And so that you can see that there's no magic. It's all very straightforward. And so that in the future, if you want to change something about how something is handling, you could appreciate the different layers of technology that we're interacting and better understand where to go do that. If you try to extend these manual techniques, though, for one person, it becomes a true three-dimensional chess set, trying to remember all the different, well, is that in HTML, or where was that cascading style sheet, or what JavaScript's doing that. And, uh, and as the site grows, one person, if they're really good at visualizing and so forth, maybe will keep up with it. But as you, your team grows uh, from one to a group, the method almost always fails. So what are the alternatives? Well, let's look at the hand-rolled solution. We already know how to do it, so that's a plus. There's not a lot of learning. Uh, but it's red. It's disadvantages. It doesn't scale well. Uh, and every time you want a new wheel, you have to reinvent a wheel. And it's nearly impossible to maintain because as generations of software come through or hardware comes through or whatever knowing where to put it just harder and harder soon uh, it becomes very hard to enhance also if you could maintain it somebody comes in and wants to have a new feature and that's nearly impossible but it has low initial cost and so it's something you can do in your back room uh, with absolutely no capital expense frameworks they have higher initial learning curve but its plus is it's highly customized a highly customized website can result uh, it supports large teams it depends on frameworks depending on the framework it can be easily it can be nearly future proof many programmers available who already know it so if you have to go out and hire more people there's a high probability you can find folks that already know how to do it WordPress is a low initial learning curve. Uh, it has a really good admin and dashboard. And it's probably got one of the best administrative back ends. Uh, the user management and access control offers great user management uh, and it gives the ability to have roles and capabilities. It's got a really strong template templating engine. Uh, localization it's not only localized across different continents and different countries, but it's also, it's easy to have it support not only desktops, but also mobile devices. There are 20 or over 20,105 active free plugins. Now, many of those you pay to upgrade, but just the fact that there's 20,000 different people out there offering plugins for it gives you an idea of how widely it is accepted. Uh, caching, it has a simple cap caching mechanism that you can turn on with a full line, 
few lines of code, and caching helps high demand websites work better. The search engine friendly URLs, because of what it generates, are friendly to the URLs, and also because there are so many Word, WordPress sites, uh, search engines spend extra effort to try to be sure that they do justice to WordPress sites. It's file uploading and media management. They're one of the best uh, in the business. It's hooks, actions, and filters offer many hooks to allow developers to call functions at specific times. It has really good error logging and it's well integrated with PHP to turn off and activate all the, the PHP's error logging. Uh, it supports multiple instances really well. So, if we look at my WordPress site, uh, it's Marshall Cemetery at federalhill.com, and this is what the front page looks like, and this is an example of what you see when you come into the admin page. So you have the ability to select the dashboard. It also makes it very clear if you have something that needs updating, every time you come in it'll remind you so that it helps you with maintenance. Uh, as you look at the dashboard, you get these comments so that help you know, hey, you've got seven things that you can look at. And if you look at the improvements it's talking about, it wants me to remove some inactive plugins and some inactive themes. Oh, and it has a PHP module that it wants me to fix. Uh, and that's something that if I didn't have WordPress, I probably wouldn't know I needed to do and something I will do. I quite frankly left these so that I had something for you all to see. As you go down and pick pages on the side, you get a display list of all the pages you have. Uh, this dash means that this is a subset of another page. Uh, and you can edit, you can trash, you can view, and you can see statistics on it. Page. If you pick a page, it looks like this, where you have the ability on the side to make it changes. And when you're ready, you can either preview it or you can update it. WordPress has something called short codes. And a short code is a small piece of code that indicates with a bracket like this. So that would be a short code that performs a dedicated function on your site and you can place it in just about anywhere you'd like. Uh, and as you add a specific feature to your page, post, or content, so there's short codes to put Google Maps in and many other things. And this URL will take you to a write-up that helps you know more about them. You can add JavaScript to WordPress and here's an article two articles that talk about adding JavaScript to WordPress and a plugin that gives or this URL lists all the plugins that are available to add JavaScript and there's multitudes of them. Uh, and don't let anybody tell you that you can't use Ajax from WordPress. WordPress is sitting on top of an Ajax system and these links will tell you more about how to enhance Ajax on WordPress. But if you're not going to use WordPress, and you get to choose, and that's a significant point right here, because if you go to work for a large existing employer that already has an infrastructure, you may, on as soon as you get through an orientation, be told, we use fill-in-the-blank here. And in that case, that's what you should learn, and you may over time decide that you have a better idea but it won't be on your day one that you'll change it. So, you know, consider Laravel if you get to choose. If not, don't waste your time. Uh, in March 2019, Laravel had 51,192 stars on GitHub, which is where it's distributed from. So that's a lot of positive reviews. Uh, Laravel authorization techniques, it makes it simple implementation. Uh, almost everything is configured 
extraordinarily. Larvell also provides a simple way to organize authorization logic and control access of resources. Larvell uses object-oriented libraries. One of the top reasons which made Larvell the best PHP framework is its ob object-oriented libraries. One of the pre-installed libraries is the authentication library that we just talked about. Although it's easy to implement, it has many advanced features such as checking active users, bcrypt hashing, password reset, cross-site request forgery protection, and encryption. Laravel also has Artisan. Uh, a developer has to usually interact with Laravel framework using a command line that creates and handles the Laravel project environment. And this tool, the command line tool is Artisan. And the tool allows us to perform a majority of those repetitive, tedious programming tasks that made development made developers a low a void programming manually. We have MVC support. Another reason that makes Laravel is it supports MVC architecture. Uh, another one that does is Symfony, but it's not open source. It ensures clarity between the logic and the presentation. MVC helps to improve. It's called a multi-view controller is what MVC stands for. It helps improve the performance, allows better documentation, and has multiple built-in functionalities. And here's how it works. The user submits a request that goes to the routing. Routing sends it to the appropriate controller. The controller interacts with the data model, which talks to the database. And then the controller invokes a view, which then goes back and talks to the request. While developing an application, everybody has to use some other way to make applications secure. Laravel takes care of the security within its framework. It uses salting hash passwords, which means that the password would never be saved in plain text on the database. It uses bcrypt hashing algorithm for generating encrypted representing of the password. So we're not talking about passwords for the site, we're talking about passwords and security inside Laravel for who has the ability to modify the site. Uh, it uses pre-prepared SQL statements which make injection attacks unimaginable. Along with this, Laravel provides a simple way to escape user input to avoid the user injection of script tags. Laravel has these security modules. A configuration, strong passwords, authentication of users, manu manually logging of users, protecting routes, HTTP basic authentication, password reminders and resets, encryption, and authentication drivers. One of the pain points developers have is to keep the database in sync between development machines. With Ravel, database migrations are extremely easy. And what we're talking about here is, so somebody's writing code which is going to add a field or change a field on the user. And there's another team working on changing code that's going to ch add a field to the material list. Well, how do you make sure that those two have the correct versions, that they don't break each other, and that there's a way to roll that change into the development so that you can test it and then move it over to the production server. With migrations, as long as you keep all the database work in migrations, in Siege you can easily migrate the changes into any other development machine you have. This is yet another reason to make Laravel the best PHP framework. It's got great tutorials called Laracasts. Uh, you're going to need to learn more in order to deliver more, whether it's Laravel or whatever. Uh, others really don't have a great way to do it. You know, if you already know how to do it, you're in good shape, and otherwise, it's word of mouth. 
Marvell offers Laracasts, which feature a mix of free and paid video tutorials that show you how to use Laravel. The videos are all made by Jeffrey Way. He's an expert and experienced instructor. He has his finger on the pulse of the essentials and offers the clear and concise instructions. The production quality is high and the lessons are well thought out and meaningful. There's also a thing called Blade Templating Engine. The Blade Templating Engine is very intuitive and helps work with the typical PHP HTML spaghetti. It's one of the best features of the framework. You know, if you've ever had to chop the if statement with an HTML inside of it, you know exactly what we're trying to help with Blade. Uh, you know, with Blade, it's really easy. The responsive interface was added to Lavelle in 5.5 in August of 2017. And this is so that it's able to deliver optimized content for not only the desktop, but for the different mobile devices you may be on. Uh, it's a class which is used to implement the interface which can be returned by the controller method. After that, the router is going to check for the instance of the responsible responsible when preparing the response from the Illustrate routing and router. You have automatic package discovery, which previously, the early versions of Lavelle, it wasn't easy to install packages, but now, with 5.5, the automatic packages discovery detects the package automatically and which user wants to install. So it knows what you've got and it keeps them current. You can turn that off if you want to. So here's a link to a Larvel introduction document. It goes into a whole lot more detail. I've really flown over this pretty quickly just because I'm trying to expose it to you, not because it's going to be on the final or anything. This is all just kind of, you know, talking about where do you go after you leave this class. So we've talked about how to create the web server, but how do we host it? Well, one option is to do it on-prem. A disadvantage of that is bandwidth. You know, many of the premises in this area don't have great bandwidth. And if they do have good bandwidth, they have it from only one source. So they're always one backhoe swipe away from being off the air. Uptime with an on-prem solution is a problem. Do you have standby generators? Do you have uh, alternate ways to get the air conditioning cooling to keep your servers cold? Very few people running on-prem have 24-7 service, but the web is up 24-7, and so your users don't want to know that, well, it's Saturday afternoon, and everybody is at home, and nobody knew that they had to change the tape and sew the things off the air. Initial expense is a problem with on-prem, because unless you're using old hardware, you've got to buy new hardware. Uh, the operating sim the operating cost is an advantage unless you really do good accounting because you know once you've got the hardware you kind of feel like well this is free well the problem is in three or four or five years your server is going to be worn out you're going to need to buy a new one uh, so I'm not sure operating is cost on prem is cheaper but people tend to think that they can't see it in their budget off premises you certainly have better bandwidth and you would expect to have redundant access to the internet. Uh, on a virtual machine it should have better uptime. Uh, you want to have redundant power and redundant network and by that we mean you know maybe you got two different power companies that send you power and on top of that you may even have diesel generators uh, and the same for networking you want to have two ways to the internet and you got to be careful that you don't have two different internet companies but they both go out of town on the same T1 or same piece of fiber or something so 
when you really get off-prem to the people that are thinking big time, I know of a place in Michigan that ran a dedicated piece of fiber to Chicago just so they would be sure that they had two ways to get to the internet. Uh, off-premises is almost always going to have 24 by 7 support. They're going to have somebody watching that server morning, noon, and night, seven days a week. Uh, you have low initial expense because they're building their capital cost into the monthly expense. So you don't have any much up front. But you do have a monthly charge, and that's probably its biggest disadvantage. What are the different types of web hosting? You have, if we're talking about off-prem, we have shared hosting, we have virtual private servers, abbreviated VPS, we have dedicated server hosting, we have cloud hosting, we have managed hosting, and we have co-location. Let's look at each one in detail. Shared hosting is perfect for an entry-level website. Uh, GoDaddy is an example of a shared hosting. This is where your website is will be on the same server as multiple websites. With a shared hosting plan, all domains share the same server resources, such as random access memory and central processing unit. However, because all resources are shared, the cost of the shared hosting plans are relatively low, making them an excellent option for website owners in their beginning stages. In most cases, beginners will find shared the simplest matter, method of hosting their website. So regardless of whether you're a small business owner or a community group or a stay-at-home mom with a desire to blog, your site can be accessible on the web. Shared hosting plans often come with many helpful tools such as website builders and WordPress hosting and the ability to email clients. Although the shared hosting provides website owners with more simplistic approach to the web, the trade-offs are that you're shared server with multiple other website owners. That means that surges in usage on one site that's on your server can affect your website's users experience. And shared hosting plans are ideal for website owners that do not receive a large amount of web traffic. The next one we're going to talk about is a VPS or virtual private server hosting. A VPS hosting plan is the ultimate middle ground between a shared server and a dedicated server. And they basically are running on, VMware is a brand name, but they're running on a virtual server, which means that you can have many different separate OS machines running on one physical server. And almost all of them now can move those virtual machines from one physical device to another one. It's ideal for website owners that need more control but don't necessarily need a dedicated server. A VPS hosting is unique because each website is hosted with its own space on the server and though it still shares a physical server with many other users. The VPS hosting provides website owners with more customization and storage space. You're still not able to handle incredible high levels of traffic or spikes in usage. Uh, and if somebody else on your server has that, it'll affect your users. Typically, the VPS hosting is using a website owners who want dedicated hosting but don't have the technical knowledge needed. Uh, VPS hosting offers the cost benefits of shared hosting with the control of dedicated hosting because you have your own virtual machine they typically will let you get to the root login of that virtual machine. It's a great choice for advanced users and those who want specific software and package installations. Which brings us to a dedicated server hosting. Uh, that gives users the most control over the server that their website is stored on. And a dedicated server means you're physically renting a 
piece of iron from the website provider. The server is exclusively rented by you and the website is only one that's stored on it. That means that you have full root admin access so that you can control everything from security to the operating system that you run on. However, all that control comes with a price. Dedicated servers cost are one of the most expensive web hosting options. Typically, they are used by website owners with high levels of website traffic and those who need the complete control of their servers. In addition to the high level of technical expertise is required for the installation and ongoing management of the server. And the other thing to remember about a dedicated server is you're renting a physical piece of iron. So don't make the mistake of getting a quote dedicated server and not getting redundant hard drives, redundant power supplies and all because just as if you have a single hard drive on a local server you're subject to that hard drive failing. If you have a dedicated server with a single hard drive you got the same problem. Cloud hosting is the buzzword of the technology industry right now. In regards to web hosting it means that many computers work together running applications used combined computing resources. It's a hosting solution that works on a network and enables companies to consume the computing resources like a utility. So if you're a radio station and most of the time you have 10 users an hour logging onto your site but when you have uh, state tournament contests or something you have 10,000 people a cloud solution is good because when you need it it will respond. It allows users to employ many resources as they need without having to build and maintain their own computing infrastructure. The resources are being used or spread across several servers reducing the chances that any downtime is due to a server malfunction and also because you're across many servers you're counting on the cloud provider to add more servers as the total load on the cloud goes up. Cloud-based hosting is scalable meaning your site can grow over time uh, you can start out with little resources and as you don't have 10 users an hour but now you have 100 there's no place you have to go out and spend a lot more money the cloud just sells you more resources as they are needed. That allows users to employ many resources as they need without having to build and maintain their own computing infrastructure. Uh, the resources are being used spread across several servers and several companies. Managed hosting. Most hosting packages you will find online are managed and the hosting company provides technical service such as the hardware, the software, setup, configuration, maintenance, hardware replacement, technical support, patching and updating and monitoring. With managed hosting, the provider looks at the day-to-day -day management of the hardware, operating system, and standardized applications. Although there are many different options to choose from when it comes to web hosting, it all comes down to choosing the plan that fits your needs. You know, each plan caters to specific different groups, and realizing your needs in a website will help you ensure that you choose the one that's right for you and your business. You hear the term co-location. Uh, so instead of keeping your servers in-house or at a private data center, you've chosen to co-locate your equipment by renting space in a co-location center. And these are typically really big, well-secured buildings. They typically have their own standby generators. They have multiple power companies. They have multiple ways to get internet in and so forth. But inside the building, they have cages, which look like the cage in the army or something. I mean, it's there's an area in the building that only you can get into, or your people, and in that cage are racks with servers. The racks may or may not be yours, but all the servers inside that are yours. And you will pay to rent space in the cage or rent space in the co-location center. 
They're going to provide the power, the bandwidth, the IP address, the cooling systems. And the space is rented in racks and cabinets. Co-location gives you access to higher levels of bandwidth than a normal office. Server room can at much lower cost. But you're left with your own devices, literally. It's your hardware that's hanging in those racks. And it, you will be expected to take care of everything, including the hardware, the software, and the services. Okay, so what did I choose to come out of this? Well, I've focused on Ajax. I think that's the future of the Internet. Uh, I'm using WordPress, and if I had an application where I couldn't use WordPress, I would adopt Lavelle. Uh, I personally, you know, cwmclass.com and several other sites that I have are running on a VPS hosting. In fact, it's one machine, and I'm running one instance of Apache, and I have multiple websites working off that. And that's CIT 253. It was a, two, a three credit hour class, data driven web pages. That was the lecture for week 15. It has been a pleasure. I look forward to talking to you. If you have any questions, I hope you will call. If there's any topics that I haven't covered, please email me for an appointment so that we can clear them up. Because the whole object of this whole exercise was to try to pass knowledge along to you, and I need your help to do that. Thank you.